Welcome to Face to Face, connecting theater makers to the public, a program from the Legacy Theater and SocialDistanceTheater.org. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to Face to Face. My name is Lauren Rosenay, and I am the Legacy Theater's company manager. Today on the show, we have Julia Baird. Julia has special ties to the entertainment field as John Lennon's sister. Among many things, she is an author, and she is also a principal at the famous Cavern Club. Welcome to the show, Julia. It's lovely to be here. Thanks to your your papa. Uh, I've been friends with him for many, many years. I actually knew your grandparents. I knew his parents as well. Wow, that's amazing. I yeah. love that you have that sort of connection. Yeah, we've known each other a long time. So you grew up and still work in Liverpool. So aside from the world associating Liverpool with the Beatles and its other history, I understand that it is also rich in theater. So can you share a little bit about the theater scene in Liverpool with us? Yes. Um, I always say to people, uh, if you come to Liverpool, please don't just come to the cavern. Just don't, L Liverpool, the Beatles grew out of the very soil that, uh, for, from Liverpool. But really and truly, don't just think, come to Liverpool, do the Magical Mystery Tour, go to the Beatles story, go to the Cavern, and then go to London. I mean, this is what happens. And I go, no, 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 you need five days, really, if you're going to do it. Because we have two cathedrals, we have the largest Gothic cathedral in Europe, and we have what we uh, lovingly call the Wigwam, big Catholic cathedral. We have one of the oldest, if not the oldest, Jewish synagogue in Europe. And everybody gets taken to see these fabulous buildings. And then the theatre. Well, you know what repertory theatre is, obviously. Mm -hmm. Big stars did repertory theatre in Liverpool before they went anywhere. That's John Gilgood, uh, Laurence Olivier. They all wrecked in Liverpool and when we, when we were at school uh, we used to go as a class every Saturday we'd all go and sit in the gods and watch anything we'd end up brushing the stage we would do anything just to be in that just to be in that space is fabulous so we've got the everyman we've got the royal court and we've got the playhouse and um, we've got the Epstein Theatre or Epstein Theatre, I think we said. We, you know, we grew up, it was Epstein and it's changed. And I keep having to remember to say Epstein. Um, uh, we've got the Unity Theatre. We've got theatres all over the place. You can see a Shakespeare play or a comedy, or you could before this lockdown, any, any night of the week. Absolutely wonderful. And they've all got a decent bar, they've all got a decent um, cafe attached to it. The Everyman, in fact, has been rebuilt. So people book to go for a meal in there. Uh, very, people in Liverpool love the theatre, believe me. And so I understand that you're also a very big Shakespeare fan. Yeah, I, uh, <laughs> have you read it? I have. And is it true that you are in the audience to see the great Sir Lawrence Olivier? Yeah. Unfortunately, not in the... I have seen him in a play, but not that one. That was Hamlet. We did Hamlet for A-level. That's our 18-year-old exam. Um, my friend and I just fell in love with the whole play. And there's a David Lewis Theatre, that's another one, a David Lewis Theatre. And we went to the David Lewis, Lewis Theatre on class, as a class. They took us everywhere to see um, Hamlet with him. And one, he's devastatingly handsome when he was young, so that was wonderful. But as an actor, I mean, really, there's little to touch him even now. There's little, little, little to touch Lawrence with him. And... Ray and I, this girl and I, we saw it every night, every night, every night for about three weeks. And I could at that time quote, if you'd said to me, fire upon it, foe, I would have said, act scene, act three, scene one, bottom of the page on the left-hand side. And when it came to the A-level exam, 
and I chose obviously Hamlet. I just wrote, practically wrote the play out. I love it. And I went, well, I don't, I don't do horror stories. You can, my partner Roger is here. He, he reads horrible books. I, oh, I, would, I would burn them. I would burn them. I don't read them. And he doesn't tell me about them because he knows I don't want my mind upset with these things. I won't watch a horror film. I won't watch a ghostly film. So, Shakespeare, there's nothing as scary, horrific, foul and vile. And people getting their eyes poked out with swords and gouged out and stabbings and murders and digging up bodies. Shakespeare fits into that horror really well. And then I put a little bit about the history of how, you know, how is it the East Bay had come to be. So I did the four, did Macbeth, Hamlet, uh, King Lear, that I can't stand, and I'd said, um, and what was the other one? Othello. I mean, Othello, how awful a play do you want? And I did put in things, you think Transylvania is bad? Someone with a nightcap and a, and a candle has nothing on the horrors in Shakespeare. Right. And um, so as a theater lover, do you have any personal experience in theater? Or do you find yourself more of someone who just really goes and appreciates it? Well, do you know what? Um, yes, I, I go my partner and I go to everything. It's one of the biggest things I'm looking forward to through this lockdown is right. to go. It's yeah. one of my favorite, favorite nights out. And you know, I don't really care what's on. <laughs> yeah, I just want to see live theater. It's like seeing live music. Nothing can replace live. I'd rather see a bad live band than listen to a good one on a CD. Yeah. So, um, when I did English A-levels, as I was saying, and we did Midsummer Night's Dream as a play, uh, not to study and write about, we did it as a play, every year we did a play. And we all, there were 13 of us in that group, and we were all told, you will audition. And I said, oh, no, 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 it's not for me, not for me. Not for me. No, you will, you are all auditioning. So I went and did this audition reading that which is just reading something and the next thing is my friends are coming saying you're titania i couldn't believe it i went to try to get out of it i said i can't do it i just can't do it and she said oh, of course you'll come and walked off and so i did titania and it was one of the worst experiences of my entire life and i had the whole family sitting on the first three rows <laughs> looking and waving and they brought the children oh. just to make some more connections that we have i've actually been in a midsummer night stream twice have you? What were you? both as to tanya oh right so, yeah. yes yeah. yes so, um so, it's yeah. a beautiful part it really is but <laughs> it's just really and truly and i end up doing public speaking it's it's I'm dragging something out of me that isn't really there. And what I did at the same time, have you heard of the Duke of Edinburgh Award? I have. Yeah, well, I did silver. Uh, I didn't get around to doing gold. I left school by then. Um, but I did the silver. And I did, uh, like, uh, mountain climbing. We were climbing in Snowdonia, which is our largest mountain range, which I loved. I absolutely loved and camping and walking. And I loved it. And I did makeup and hairstyles with the Leichner 5 and the Leichner 9 and, you know, the, and then a company, the company came, the Doily Car Opera Company came to Liverpool through the Empire and did all of um, the plays. Wow. Of, yeah. So I volunteered to do the makeup and hairstyles and I've never had such a good time in all my life because I was backstage, Lauren. Mm -hmm. Being in the theatre, I don't want to be on the stage. Mm -hmm. And I think a lot of people feel that way and I feel like once you start doing backstage roles, you start appreciating more about theatre and more about what goes into making a show yeah. 
what yeah, an end. Yeah. Well, I did all the Gilbert and Sullivan's. They did one, one every Friday for, is it 13 or eight or, I mean, I can't remember. It's so long ago now, but um, I did love that. Have you ever seen a show with John Lennon or with your family? Oh, yeah. 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 Now, d hang on. Do you mean with the real John or <laughs> a show with pretend John? Both, I guess. <laughs> I don't go and see any of the plays, Lauren. I just, any, anything that they do. And people keep saying, Liverpool, you've got to come and see this. And I haven't got to come and see it. It's always wrong. And what am I supposed to do? Stand out there and say, hang on, stop. <laughs> oh, but, God. Uh, John on stage, yes, I've seen many, many, many times. Yeah. Wow. And then did you ever attend theatre shows with John? Yeah. 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 We grew up. Uh, we grew up doing these things from children's pantomimes, to school play, as I said, school play. Everybody went to everything. The whole family gathered together and went to everything. Oh, that is so amazing. What yeah. wonderful memories to have. And so I actually have one of your books here that you wrote. Oh, now is that is a really unusual one. Yes. And um, it is called In His Own Youth, In My Own Words. Yeah. So was this your first book you wrote? or Yes, it was. That was um, five years after John had died in 1985. There's a very well-respected program here. Um, I, I was trying to think of an American equivalent called Panorama. It's the BBC. It's a bit like your CNN sort of stuff. Mm -hmm. Uh, and it's very well, was very well respected, of course, and all this dwindled away now, hasn't it? But at that time, the panorama uh, deals, still deals with serious, serious um, issues, but I think it's dumbed, everybody thinks it's dumbed down now. At that point, it was quite serious stuff. And because John had died five years previously, uh, panorama did a special. Uh, on John's life and my old had a young child uh, 1985 he was six because he was born in 1979 so we put him packed him off to bed David and uh, your dad knows him well and um, the older children wanted to watch it and I didn't but I thought they said mummy everyone in school will have seen it the next day and they're in high school aren't they and I thought you're, you're right I can't say you can't see this because they'll be the only children in the school that haven't seen it so we watched it and I cried from beginning to end it was so wrong Lauren it, the story was so wrong Julian wasn't even mentioned it went straight to Sean uh, Cynthia had long dark hair with a headscarf on, like she was a market trader, a beautiful woman. Um, everything about it, everything about it was tacky. And at the end, there was a little, little snippet of Yoko. I don't think she'd seen it. To be fair to her, I am almost sure she actually didn't see it because this is an add-on from New York. She's sitting with her arm around Sean, who's five. And they said, what did you think of it? And she said, oh, it was like wonderful. And I, I really cannot think she's seen it. I think she's probably just said that. I hope so. Because she then said, it's a, it's a wonderful way for Sean to get to know about his father's family. And um, no. <laughs> Nothing could be further from, from the truth. So that was the first. I have a friend who lives not far from here and she had a printing press in her house because we're all mad, we're all mad. She had an old printing press and I said, she's Juliet, I'm Julianne with the two Jews. I said, do you think that would, do you think that would print? She said, why? And I said, well, did you see the Panorama programme? Because in those days you couldn't watch again, you, did, you missed it. If you hadn't seen it, you missed it. But actually I did and I didn't want to mention it to you. She said it was appalling. Absolutely appalling. I've known her since she was 18. So I said, I want to write something. She said, I'll make it work. And so she got somebody from a printer's, because we don't have these people anymore, do we? Because everything's happening now. Mm -hmm. Come, and that's it. 
I hand wrote it and we collated it ourselves. We did everything ourselves. Kind of show the, the writing. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Yeah. So that was the very, very first. And I took it to Liverpool, met your dad. That was 1986. I met him. Wow. And, um, and so your other book, which is Imagine This, Growing Up With My Brother John Lennon. So what inspired you to write about that? And what was the process like for you? Well, you can see that that one is only little. I was working. I was teaching in a high school at the time. I had three children. Um, the six-year-old was easy peasy, of course, but the others had homework that I was helping with. I have marking. Life was just, you know, family, full hit family. So I rushed that out very quickly. Right. But when I came to write the book, my aunt, you see there were five sisters, and my middle aunt, Nanny, was the family chronological. She never forgot a birthday, ever. And she knew everything. Um, and I kept asking her to tell me the story, and she wouldn't. And when she was dying, I was looking after her the last couple of years. And she started to talk to me. She never got dementia. She was 83 then. She died when she was 86. And I said, Nanny, do you realize you're telling me the story that you wouldn't tell me? And she said, of course I realize. She said, you're the only one that's ever asked. Now just listen to me. And she told me again and again, she told me a lot more than is in the book. And it changed everything. What she told me, she was like the, she unlocked, unlocked the chest, if you like. And even John wouldn't have known these things. So while writing this book, is it true that you also sat down with Paul McCartney? And yeah. what was Paul's yeah. part in, in this book? Well, I just, um, I phoned his office and said I was writing a book and I talked to him and he said yes straight away. He's, he's always nice with me. I never ask him for anything, only tickets to the concert and stuff like that. <laughs> so uh, he said, yeah, come down to London and we'll meet in the office. And that's what we did. When I say meet in the office, it doesn't like it. You know, upstairs is like somebody's house because that's he spends a lot of time there smacking into London. So I went. And we sat there all afternoon and I taped him and put it on CD. And he says, it's yours, do what you like with it. Well, because it's Paul talking, I tried to cut me out, Lauren. And this is again, not, not the acting bit, you know. I was nervous, of course. Um, I repeated myself, of course. I sounded stupid, of course. So I got a friend. Do you know the, do you know the band OMD? It orchestral makes it familiar. Yeah, orchestral maneuvers in the dark. Uh, they tour in America all the time. Well, the drummer used to live with his studio. We're in farmland. Used to live on a farm and in a barn he had his studio. And I went and I said, um, can you please take me off it? And so he's taken me out of it as much as he possibly can without cutting into Paul. And it's much better now. So it's Paul. Uh, I was just asking him all these questions and then at the end, if you ever listen to it, you'll hear that I'm getting garbled and faster uh, because it was time to go. I'd had him there, people were coming in all the time saying, oh Paul, Paul, but he was saying, no, 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 no. And in the end I thought, I've got to wrap this up. I was bit, it would have been rude to keep him there any longer. So I raced through the last questions absolutely raced through them but he's talking about the Beatles about his mother about our mother about his relationship with John it was um it was a good thing to have done and then so now having written this book to kind of let everyone know what really happened and mm -hmm. to kind of stomp on all the rumors and the false yeah. stories yeah you feel like the movie that was adapted from this book horrible yeah so were you involved in that at all no, no it was meant to be based on the book lauren and what a travesty but you know who is it jack 
who wrote Jack Higgins? Jack Higgins, I think he, he wrote The Eagle, and he's a huge, huge, huge writer about war stories. And they've made films, The Eagle has landed, they've made films of all his books. And he said, I take the money and run. I never, ever watch the film because it's not my book anymore. Well, that's, that's all very well if you're writing a fictional account. Right. But when you're writing a biography, it was, we had row upon row. And um, the publisher, my publisher, wanted me to sanction the film, which would have meant going to the Sundance Festival and everything. And I just said, I can't do it. She said, look, will you come to London and we'll have a private screening before it goes out? And I said, all right, that's only fair. I know already because I've got the script. I know already. But that is a fair thing to ask. Right. Uh, so I went and cried and cried. And my publisher said, won't you do it, please? It will, it will so help everything and the profile and the book. I said, no, Rowena, I can't. And I phoned, immediately phoned my eldest son who was living in London and said, maybe come and get me left and we ended up rowing in with the script writer the script writer was from manchester so he doesn't understand liverpool he was in his 30s what does he know mm -hmm. and you might think you know everything but deep down you know that you don't know anything at all really yeah i'm still learning everything um it was just it was a travesty lauren a, uh, an absolute travesty and they did actually attach my name to it because people were, with the internet, people were telling me it was being presented as based on my book. I think it was even, maybe even in America, it's actually said based on a book by, but I have not got endless pockets, neither do I have an endless life to go suing them. I just sort of cut myself off. And if anybody, I don't go around talking about it, but if you ask me, I will tell you. So then do you hope that one day that book could be adapted into a film that's accurate? That would be fun. That would be wonderful. Are you going to do it? <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> <laughs> I'd be up for it. <laughs> okay. And then, so just on a lighter note, I understand that you also work with the Cavern Club. Yeah. So for people who may not know, can you just talk about what the Cavern Club is and what your role is there? Right. Well, I'm a director. Um, and there's four of us that actually own it. I'm the minor shareholder. I own one eighth of the whole business, um, which is great fun. Great. The irony, the irony of being a part owner of the very club where Don said he's never been so happy as when he was on the cavern mm -hmm. That's that's. I do think of that when I'm in there. Have you been? Have you? I have never been, and I think my family was supposed to be going this summer, and then... Oh, my goodness. Now, look what happened. Well, um, we, keep, we keep going to take you to the zoo. I know, and yeah. we're looking forward to it, but it's now... the largest zoo in Europe. I know. We so are when you come, them. if any of the children come, every year Charles says, oh, they're not with me, they're not with me, so I'm not taking you to the zoo. <laughs> so... Uh, um, yeah, the cabin. It's a fabulous club. It's um, it's got the live lounge at the back, which is where Paul has been on stage a few times. Uh, it's got the 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 cabin that you all know with the arches in the front. It's got a bar. It's fairly grotty, but in the nicest way. The electrics are all one million percent. The air conditioning, everything. But it's it's an old. It's got to keep its um it's uh, atmosphere it's ambience it used to be a dance club uh, there's a club in paris that two young lads were hitching around and everybody it's a rite of passage everybody hitches off and goes to paris i mean that's what you do john did it paul did it they all did it. i did it and they found a jazz club called le Havre, dave and they came back to liverpool entranced with le Cavo and rented an old fruit and vegetable warehouse in the basement and called it the cavern. So it was a jazz club to begin with. And when uh, Paul was doing Long Tall Sally, 
the audience were complaining mm -hmm. and the owner went up to them and said if you don't this is not a rock club and if you don't stop playing that awful music you'll have to leave it's definitely a rock club now and we have bands from all over the place and do you like adele i do yeah. yeah well she launched the her cd 21 in the cavern wow. by her own by her own request that's amazing yeah yeah it really is iconic you've got to come i can't believe that that you haven't been yet I promise. it's a big trip i know it's a big trip and so talking about the strawberry field so um we all know and love the song by the beatles and can you just talk about the real strawberry field and what yeah. your involvement is with that yeah i'm an honorary president of that and i stress honorary because it's mainly for promotion the strawberry field it's liverpool was a very wealthy shipping port and shipping magnates when they made their money they removed themselves from the city center with all the big beautiful georgian houses this is in the mid 19th century and built themselves gothic piles of houses and the two houses there ship owners one william gladstone one of our greatest prime ministers he was born in one of these houses and a shipping magnet owned that's not famous particularly mm -hmm. owned strawberry field and it was called strawberry field uh, presumably because the straw there were strawberries there that's what we think um when he sold it in 1936 something like that he sold it to the salvation army and the salvation army opened the children's home originally for girls and then mixed and william gladstone house had become a remand home or a naughty boys home so you had the naughty boys right next door to the, uh, the the young girls and then the girls and boys not always orphans but whose parents couldn't just couldn't um, feed them basically Liverpool was a poverty-stricken city in some areas very wealthy like many places in one area and not so wealthy in another and it became a children's home and John used to go and sit there in a tree and watch them play. Right. When uh, the Beatles split up as a touring band, not finished, they were back in the studio. When they split up as a touring band, which was following the August Candlestick Park, San Francisco, total chaotic um, concert show, where Presumably, it is said that they only opened their mouths and didn't actually sing because the screaming was so much. Uh, they all decided that's enough. And I have heard it said, but I don't know. It's actually on the stage, in the middle, in that stadium. They actually said, this is it. No more. And they all went off to do their own thing. We all needed a break before they got back in the studio. Um, Paul uh, started off with Wings. And made band on the run right. went touring and brought linda into the band um ringo became the voice of thomas the tank hugely popular uh george went into the sitar and more of a religious aesthetic mystic type of life and john wanted to try his hand at acting and so he goes to almeria southern spain to take part in how i won the war and while he was there there's a lovely quote on strawberry field gallery wall saying anyone who's done any acting knows there's a lot of hanging about and he wrote strawberry field originally as a poem without even the word strawberry field in it and he was talking looking back to his childhood and he had seen strawberry field as a place of sanctuary um it was uh tarted up if you like it was dressed by Paul and George Martin back in the Abbey Road studios in time for Sergeant. In fact, it was released. Uh, the record company was desperate for a single to come out. And it was the double A side, wasn't it? With Strawberry Field on one side and Penny Lane on the other. So the two places within two miles of each other, strangely. 
and one was John's song and the other one was Paul's song. So that was the double A side. I think it was the only double A side they did. Uh, I'll be shot down for that with people saying, no, 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 they've done this. Anyway, um, so the song came out a lot more elaborate than John had intended with the full orchestra, with George Martin and Paul had moved in and tweaked it and stuff. But it started out as John thinking back about his childhood and he called it himself, my only psychoanalytic poem. Now, as a play, bring, bring to mind the sanctuary bit, the Salvation Army, I'm not a Salvationist, but it's a wonderful organization and what it's doing here. It has opened a steps to work program. And that is literally steps towards work. For youngsters, young people between, I think 18 and 25, with mild to moderate learning disabilities. Mm -hmm. so you, you may have a mix of Down syndrome, or Asperger's, of learning difficulties, of maybe cerebral palsy, different disabilities. And we're all dragged through the school system, kicking and screaming. And for these, these youngsters with disabilities, it's often not the best experience of their lives. And there's not a lot for any of them when they leave. So um, it's a training program. But the most important thing I do think that the Salvation Army and their coaches, their staff coaches do for them, is give them a sense of self, a sense of value, and a sense of work. I haven't had much of it before, I can tell you. Yeah. Uh, one boy wanted to be a chef, cooking for Liverpool football team. Wow. So the, the Salvation Army has a team of people out networking all the time. And it, unfortunately, Lauren, it's only in Liverpool. Whenever I give a talk to promote it, I'm saying, I want to see this in in America, in every other city, it's needed everywhere. The, the, the groups are kept quite small and intimate so that each child, each student can have individual attention by the class coaches who are lovely, lovely people. And um, there are about eight to 10, almost 50 children, students, I keep calling them the children, almost 50 students have gone through already. And they're nearly all in work. Now, I'm not talking full-time, Lauren. I'm not talking a mortgage, 2.4 children. I'm not talking about anything that one might consider as the way to go. Because it isn't the way to go for everybody. And certainly not if you have a learning disability that is actually trying to walk. You're being pulled back all the time. You need help, don't you? You need the crutch. You literally need the crutch. And Salvation yeah, yeah. Army is being the crutch. And they're all in if they want to work with pets, if they want to work with, they say what they'd like to do. And the Salvation Army finds it for them. It's called the Steps to Work Programme. And if you look at um, juliabaird.eu, if you put that in you, whatever you're doing, I've written a blog. That there's only one blog on my site, and it is the entire history with pictures and little videos of strawberry. Wow. You know, hearing you talk about the strawberry field and everything that you guys are doing there i actually got chills because i think organizations like that are so important yeah. especially now when we just need more <laughs> compassion it's and empathy and empathy. understanding make a difference and i just i i have no words i just think that is so so mm. tremendous well it's driven completely by the salvation army and the uh, I didn't know until I joined them here. Everybody knows the Saudi Army. Everybody, everybody. It doesn't matter if you're in America. It doesn't matter where you are. They're around with those pins, aren't they? Rattle, rattle, rattle. And their bands and everything. And we grew up with every occasion you had to be the brass band from the Saudi Army. Um, but I didn't realize that they are the biggest providers of homes to the homeless, both in the UK and the US. Oh. I did not know that. Amazing. Yeah, it is. So they work tirelessly. They've taken on the Christian ethic mm -hmm. about loving your neighbor. So, Julia, can you tell everyone where to find you if they want to know more about your work and um, if they want to find your book? And where can we find you? 
Right. Well, if you look at juliabad.eu, there's a contact there. The book is there. CD is there, Paul's CD. There's a fabulous cabin poster. But the blog is there, the Strawberry Field blog. And there is a contact at the bottom. Thank you so much, Julia, for Thank you. on Face to Face today. Mm -hmm. I am just so honored to have been able to sit down and talk to you about your wonderful, wonderful experience and your love of theater and just thank you. And I look forward to meeting you in person someday when I'm able to come up to England. In the elephant house, in the zoo. <laughs> <laughs> All right, thank you so uh, much. That's lovely. Give my best to your dad and thank you very much. And I hope, I wish you success with whatever you're going to do with this. Thank you so much. Thank you for joining us on Face to Face. We would like to thank our sponsors, Oak Tree Development and the Community Foundation for Greater New Haven and Brad Ross for the themed music. You can follow us on LegacyTheaterCT.org.